Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer, and today I am going to be making a sifting through stocks quickly video. Um, these have been pretty popular in the past. This is going to be the fourth installment, and I will have a playlist of all of these. Um, so the purpose of this video is to show how I use fast graphs to sift through um, stocks quickly when stocks maybe I don't know anything about them necessarily just going stock by stock and what I'm looking for are stocks that have the basic metrics that will fit one of my main strategies that I use um, and really what I'm doing is I'm not so much selecting stocks that I might buy although that is what happens is I'm really just excluding the ones that don't fit and it's a way to cut down um, stocks quickly so you don't spend too much of your time on the stocks that um, aren't going to probably be a good fit for whatever strategy you're using. So I have like three, or three to five main strategies that I use, really like three and then a couple smaller ones that come in every now and then. Um, the first of those I call the full cycle strategy. It's an earnings and earnings growth based valuation strategy. So pretty simple. Think like growth at a reasonable price type stocks. Um, maybe some pure value stocks occasionally can get in there too. That's probably my main strategy. Um, and the one you see me make me most valuation videos on the channel here using. I also have a deep cyclical strategy, which is what I started um, doing back in 2015, 2016, um, as kind of my specialty is deep cyclical stocks. There aren't as many opportunities there that come up, uh, but usually they're more profitable. So these will be high quality businesses that just go through deep um, earning cycles, right? So it kind of needs to fit both of those metrics to um, make it on my list of things that I'm going to monitor for the future. Um, and then I have what I call it the profit growth strategy. Um, I don't make public videos on this one. It's exclusive to the Cyclical Investors Club um, investing group over on Seeking Alpha. I'll have a link for that down in the description. If you join Patreon, you can get a big discount if you ever decide to join the full Cyclical Investors Club service too. So those will all be in the description. Um, but I will, if I see stocks that are on this list that fit that pattern, I'll just say, okay, that's a potential um, growth stock. So because my earnings based strategy tries to have a full economic cycles worth of data, a lot of times stocks will kind of get excluded from that because there just isn't long enough, as much data that I need that I want anyway. Um, and so the growth strategy can pick up kind of earlier stage potential long term growth companies that would be excluded from my other strategy. Um, just simply because there wouldn't be enough historical data. Uh, so that's my third kind of main strategy. Now the other two strategies that I use, I have a special REIT strategy. It's a little bit more momentum based. That one's also exclusive to the investing group. Um, and then I have a dividend strategy. It 90% of the time it's gonna overlap with my earning strategy, but there are times occasionally when kind of a dividend based analysis works a little bit better for a stock. Um, especially maybe if earnings can be kind of moderately cyclical, maybe not cyclical enough to get put into the deep cyclical category. So um, if I notice any of those, usually I don't have too many, um, then I have that fifth kind of strategy that I can use. So I'm going to go through the mid cap, the S&P 400 mid cap index. I've already gone through um, tickers that start with uh, a through C, so I'm going to do D and E in this video. That'll be 30, about 30 stocks, um, I think. Um, and basically, if a stock doesn't fall into one of my strategies, there's three main reasons why I might not um, spend any more time on it, basically. One is there's just not enough data. So um, it usually it takes a minimum of two years to even get into my growth strategy parameters, two to three. So anything that's IPO'd in the past two years probably isn't going to get on my list. It's going to get excluded. For some strategies, I require much more data. The cyclical strategy, I like to have two full cycles, down cycles, so I can kind of measure how far it might fall during a down cycle. Um, so if it's deeply cyclical and only has one or it just doesn't have too much data or it's in an industry I think could be deeply cyclical, 
it could get excluded for not having enough data for that particular stock. And they all kind of have data parameters that I need to have because um, it's a little bit more of a quantitative system. Like it's like 80% quant, like 20% judgment um, for most of my strategies. Um, and then sometimes these stocks are just too hard. They don't have a pattern. They don't like an earnings pattern and they aren't consistent. Um, they're in an industry that's hard to predict, sometimes insurance. I, I made a video about construction and engineering businesses and how like his, a lot of the things I try to do use historical earnings patterns to try to predict the future. Well, sometimes certain businesses don't lend themselves well to that. Pharma companies sometimes. I will sometimes buy these, um, but I usually like to have a pretty big margin of safety when I do, and I typically do it in relatively small amounts. But it's pretty easy for a business to fall into that kind of too hard category if it just doesn't fit what I do or I don't feel like I, my strategies are a good way to project what's going to happen in the future over the medium term, like two to five years. Um, and then quality is a big one too. I want businesses that have the ability to grow earnings faster than inflation um, and pr usually have a history of doing so. So that's my definition of quality. A quality business can grow their earnings faster than inflation over a period of time. Not just one year, but like they have a history of doing that. This eliminates a lot of businesses. If I was to go into the small cap world, like half of them would immediately get disqualified just for the quality because they don't have the earnings quality that's there. If I was to go to the S&P 500, it's a much higher quality index. Um, so you would see most of the businesses there have a history of earnings that are rising faster than inflation. Um, so I'm doing the mid cap because it's a good mix. Like it's kind of in between. It's not going to, it's, let's put it this way. 90% of the small caps would get eliminated pretty quickly if I sifted through them. Um, you know, maybe like 80% of the S&P 500 would get included. And then, so the mid caps are somewhere usually in between there. Usually there's some quality companies that are rising. There's some poor qualities that are um, declining and there are some that are just kind of holding their own. So it gives a good, a better mix. So that's why I'm using the mid cap index. So with that set up, um, let's get into this. So I'm gonna use fast graphs as the main graphing tool to um, quickly sift through these stocks. I have a 25% off affiliate link down in the description for FastGraphs if you want to try it out. They have free trials. Um, I would say, like, this is one of the main reasons I really like to have FastGraphs is it gives me immediate impression. Um, I can make pretty quick judgments right off the bat and just quickly eliminate the stocks that aren't really worth my particular time. Um, so if you want to check that out, you can. And I think we're ready to get into it. So. We're going to start with uh, Darling Ingredients. So this dark green area on the fast graph is their earnings. That's usually what I'm watching initially. And then I also kind of want to see how the price, which is this black line, reacts to that. So when I look at this, two things come out come at me first. One, these earnings aren't very predictable. Uh, they fluctuate a lot when like so if you if we just go back to 2004 here earnings are falling that's not even a recession that's kind of weird right before the recession they bump up and then after they come down it's choppy they peak in 2011 which is kind of weird and then they decline for six years that's more of a stagnation secular decline thing and then we get just before the pandemic and then they rock it up higher right and then during the pandemic, they really rock it up. So they must have gotten some pricing power during the pandemic. So this is agricultural. Judging from their name, I'm guessing that they have they make ingredients for things. I don't know if it's going to be like a chemical company or because um, sometimes agricultural products can be something in those lines or parallel to it, or if it's really just like basic ingredients for things. Um, but we immediately see that this boom is followed by a pandemic um, stimulus bust. So that would be my take on this. But overall, I would say um, it's just too unpredictable for me. Even before the pandemic, earnings weren't were too hard to predict. So this would go into the too hard category or 
the quality. I wouldn't quite mark it off for quality because they did eventually get these earnings to recover. So I don't want to discount that. Um, so I'll just mark this one down as in the too hard category. All right, let's see, what do we have next? Dropbox, DBX. Okay, so Dropbox only goes back to 28, 2019, okay? The stock price hasn't really done too much since it went public, okay? Basically flat, that's not uncommon for an IPO. Um, usually they even fall more than this, but we see they have a good earnings trend. Now what's weird is, let's see how much debt they have. Uh, looks like they have a lot of debt, but mostly cash to offset it, just glancing at that. Let's look at their basic earnings because it's kind of weird that, so we have this earnings bump during uh, the COVID and now it's slowly coming down with the basic earnings, um, but they are profitable. So I guess my question with Dropbox would be, um, I don't think that they're growing fast enough to qualify for my fast growth strategy, which is where they would need to come in at since they only have data going back to 2019. So I think for me, I would just go ahead and put this one in not enough data um, because this would probably be an earnings-based analysis and they're only growing at 8%, not enough to get into my fast growth category, but they haven't really gone through a full economic cycle to see how cyclical they might be. So I would put that one in the not enough data right now category. Um, Donaldson, DCI. Okay, so this is a nice looking long-term chart. We have a little bit of cyclicality that comes, you know, uh, we have the Great Recession here. We have kind of the Industrial Recession, recession here where earnings dropped a couple, couple of years. Um, but overall, pretty decent long-term growth. Let me shorten this and just see what their basic earnings growth rate is. So 16% Kager, uh, let's go one more year forward because you see that big jump right there. So 9%, that's poor, probably more realistic. That's a solid good, good long-term earnings growth. So it has the quality, it has the earnings. It's gone through at least one full cycle here. Um, the stock has been pretty cyclical when there are, uh, the stock price I should say has been much more cyclical than the actual earnings decline. It fell like 40%, probably a little more than that during March 2020. I bet we have a similar decline here. So this wouldn't be cyclical enough for me to declare it a cyclical, but you know you can get these opportunities when there's moderate cyclicality. Uh, so this would, um, I would put this one in the full cycle category and watch earnings and you could do a basic earnings analysis. Uh, right now it's trading at a 21 PE at a 9% growth rate or whatever, even 10%. It's a little expensive, but definitely worth watching. So that's the first one I would definitely monitor. I think I actually do monitor that one. So Dino, uh, HF Sinclair, this is gonna be a good one to look at. So I bought this one. I think I even made a video on the channel back in 2021, early 2021. Um, you can see earnings have their up and down, very high uh, up and down pattern here. Um, this was kind of a unusual peak. If you take those two out and just use this, go to here, go to here, go to here, you can kind of see that generally speaking they're having higher and higher peaks. They had another high peak here. So you can kind of see that the overall quality is, is there. Um, higher earnings peaks, lower, or there, there was an exception when oil is negative during the pandemic, but I kind of give uh, make an exception for that. Um, mostly earnings do stay positive even when they're even though they're deeply cyclical. So positive here, a higher low there, make an exception for this low. And now we're coming off this uh, pandemic era boost. I have taken profits in this one. Um, so this is definitely a deeply cyclical business. Um, and so it goes in the deep cyclical category. And I would try to buy it during the lows. I bought it right around here, I think, last time. Um, but you can see he, you can get really good returns if you can buy it, even if you just pick kind of a low there. Should be able to get, see, that's 200% return. I think I got like 100% return on mine, buying here and selling up here. 
So you just want to buy these when they're at cyclical lows and then sell them when they're at cyclical highs. They don't have to have superb growth, um, just good quality growth over time. So definitely deep cyclical, definitely one I still watch. Um, DKS, Dick Sporting Goods. So this is like sporting goods retail. Um, I'm guessing a pandemic boom for these guys too. Yep. So we kind of have two different eras here. And the nice thing about the fast graph is you can shorten it to get a view of what it looked like before the pandemic. So very solid uh, long-term earnings growth. Uh, a little bit of cyclicality, which one would normally expect. It's a little weird that they had this drawdown. My guess is they probably had some sort of M&A and that you're going to see basic earnings drop around oh, a little bit, not as much as one might expect. I'm not sure exactly what went on there. Um, so this all looks pretty good, worth monitoring. We have this COVID uh, stimulus boom. We have the bust and then they're maintaining right there, which is really great for them. Um, I would put this in the full cycle earnings category, but I probably wouldn't be buying here because I would still be scared that this is earnings are going to fall off a cliff at some point. Um, but definitely worth monitoring. High quality business meets all those things. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Dolby, DLB. I think these guys do like the sound, like the Dolby surround sound stuff. Dolby Laboratories. Okay, so here is one that is not going to have enough quality. So back here in 28 or 20, 2005 to 2011. Um, this is the type of earnings growth that I would want to see. It's okay to have an occasional downturn, but you can see it took like 10 years for them just to get their earnings back to where they were then. They immediately fell back and now they're trying to claw back. The market is paying 33 PE, so they see something in the future they like. Probably because if we shorten this fast graph, recent earnings are growing 20%, 15%. So the market's betting that they can keep this new earnings growth pattern going. I personally tend to lean more on the historical pattern. So I would I would look at like from here to here. That's pretty super flat. Let's actually shorten it. We'll just look at what the fast graph says. This is without making adjustments for like these declines. Um, and that's only a 4% earnings growth. So this is not high enough quality for me. And they probably just don't have a big enough growth runway, honestly, to, to go long, to grow 20% or 15% long term like the market's predicting. Um, okay, where are we at? Doximity. I have, I don't, did they change their name? I don't know. Guess we'll find out. So, okay, so this one, we have an IPO. This is usually what IPOs do, by the way. They go public, they get money from the public. Insiders cash out the first several years and the stock price falls in half. That's pretty normal. That's why I don't buy the first couple years. So the question is, would this be um, good for my growth strategy? And the answer is no. Earnings is only expected to grow like single digits. Um, so that would be um, not enough data. So we would want to see what this does in a recession, how this all plays out uh, before I would think about getting in there because it doesn't have the growth prospects there. And I would recheck these uh, periodically. You know, it's not like a, I'll never look at it again, but the evidence so far isn't there for it. And I do have other metrics I look at for my growth strategy. This is just the initial kind of impression that I'm getting. So Dynatrace. So here's one that looks a little bit better. We have the initial IPO. The price is actually higher than that. Uh, we've experienced the decline off of the COVID uh, stimulus boom and the meme stocks and the IPOs and that whole SPAC thing. So they had, they had that. They got the boost. They've bottomed now from that. And now the question is, uh, can they grow fast enough um, since then? Really 20% is kind of what I'm looking at. This year it doesn't look like it. The market thinks maybe it can. The last two years it has. I, this would be right on the borderline basically of the fast growth. So I would probably monitor it for fast growth right now if I just happened upon it and then at least look at the other metrics. It's at least interesting um, that way. Uh, DTM midstream. All right.
Right. So generally midstreams, I just avoid altogether. So I would put this, um, but there's not enough data. So really, this is just there's not enough data to make a decision. I might be tempted if things looked super great. Uh, Duolingo, D-U-O-L. I've been working on my Spanish on Duolingo. I keep doing it. I don't know if it's helping that much, but <laughs> maybe someday. Um, so in terms of growth stocks, this is what we kind of want to see. We have IPO. They weren't earning money. So you can think, oh, well, they, that's why they needed to raise money so they could expand. They're starting to earn money now. It's growing super duper fast. So this is one I would definitely monitor as a fast growth stock just to see what happens. I don't know what the long-term growth spot prospects are really for them, but um, it'd be worth monitoring and at least considering. Uh, Euronet Worldwide, I, don't, I have not heard of this one. It's all co also kind of good to get an idea of uh, just what's out there. Okay, so this is interesting. So leading up to the pandemic, um, earnings growth looked really good. Let's see what these guys actually do. Oh, okay, payment processing, all right. Looked pretty good and then pandemic hit and the earnings got crushed. So I wonder if they have to do with like maybe brick and mortar retail sales maybe, that would kind of make sense. And now earnings are coming back but the stock, but the stock price is still down um, I'm going to put this one in the full cycle thing anyway to look at closer um, just to see kind of we can check the basic earnings too because it looks to me like earnings are recovering they definitely had I would say very economically sensitive so this this might be more of a cyclical let's look at the price movement so the gap earnings here, the basic earnings are definitely, yeah. So this would be actually more of like a deep cyclical and it might end up being a little too hard, but it's kind of somewhere in, be, in between um, kind of earnings and, and full cyclical. But I would look at it more closely to see if there's something here that, to see if the market makes sense. There's probably a reason why it's declining. Maybe they're losing market share or something, but it would require more investigation. But I wouldn't dismiss it completely out of hand, so put it on the list to look at a little bit closer. So East Group Properties, that's gonna be a REIT. So I'll put that in the REIT strategy. Um, EHC, Compass Health. I haven't looked at this one either, I don't think. Okay, so this is interesting. Off to a rough start here. Negative earnings, what do these guys do? Healthcare facility, okay. And then they've come back. They struggled during the pandemic. Okay, fair enough. Earnings are starting to come back. Um, the market is pretty bullish. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would probably put this one in the full cycle camp at least to look at. I've been a little cautious with the healthcare facilities, but um, you you could you could if it became a deal, you can make it work. Okay, Elf. So this is what like a good growth stock looks like recently. So at first, it, they had a good first year. Earnings, the stock came down off their IPO. They kind of found a bottom earnings wise. And now since 2021, they have like very steady growth. Um, so this looks to me like I would put it in my growth stock strategy. Although um, this year for some reason, earnings growth is probably because of like a pandemic stimulus bust type of a thing. Um, it looks like earnings growth is going to slow, so one would want to be careful that um, that earnings growth keeps picking up. I'm not sure exactly why the market's as negative as it is right now on the earnings growth, but when they're growing 90-90% for a couple years in a row, that's worth looking at as a growth stock. Um, lifestyle properties, that's going to be another REIT for the REIT strategy. And let me, I can look at, let me just look at one of these. So just because it's a REIT doesn't mean it really qualifies. And I don't make public videos about the REIT strategy, but I do require that there's like five years worth of data, which there is for this one. So yeah, you could, you could um, look at it and at least the data is there to put in the strategy um, and monitor. So let's see, MCOR EME. Let's 
see here. Oh, so, all right, so this is pretty interesting. What do these guys do? Oh yeah, construction engineering. So I just made a video about how I generally avoid the construction engineering um, companies because the earnings can be kind of unpredictable. But if you wanted to do deeper research and take it, so for me, this is gonna go in the too hard category immediately. But if you wanted to do more research and you felt really comfortable, you could use an earnings-based analysis. Their earnings are have been very steady historically, except for this one down period. So, um, you know, if if a person felt more comfortable, then they could look at it closely. But I don't, so I'm not. <laughs> And Novus. Let's see what these guys do. Healthcare equipment. So this would be not high enough quality because earnings really haven't, especially if you go to this since like 2015, earnings are trending down. So that's not high enough quality to meet my standards. Um, ENS. All right, let's open this up a little bit. So yeah, this looks pretty interesting. Let's see what these guys do, electrical components. Now, one thing I would be careful about, this can be cyclical, but the earnings, the adjusted earnings at least are not super cyclical. Uh, the price definitely is. So we had a long period of kind of stagnation and then um, probably AI or some kind of demand for whatever their electrical components are for like data centers probably is my guess, came along and kind of gave them a boost. Um, the stock price is very cyclical. So you want to be careful about this. And generally that industry is cyclical. So they lost 80% during the, um, during 2008. I would go ahead and put this one in kind of the earnings based category with the caveat that you want to buy it when it's way off its highs. So you wouldn't want to buy it like now and try to break it. I wouldn't anyway. Um, again, 50% down. So this, I would basically be treating this like a cyclical stock, but knowing that the actual earnings don't tend to be nearly as cyclical as the price. That's probably really, yeah, you almost got a 50% decline there. So these 50% declines during a mid cycle when the rest of the economy is kind of okay, you could maybe in, get doubles out of them. I mean, here's another one probably, this is probably 100% return, right? 80, and I didn't pick the top, so so yeah. I would say I, I, I would put this one in the full cycle category. Did I do that already? I don't think so. Okay. Let's see. Uh, where were we? EPR did that. Let's see where we were at here. ENS. Okay, yeah, EPR. All these uh, E starting uh, REITs are, I get them mixed up quite a bit. So I thought I'd already done that one. Okay, so I put that one down as a REIT. Um, EQH. Equitable Holdings. Okay, I have taken a look at this one because people have asked about it. I think these guys are, I'm going to wait for it to load. I want to say they're involved in credit. Yeah. So financial services, I definitely want more data than this. I want to see them survive like a, a real recession. So not enough data for me for this one. Um, because if they're involved in lending in any kind of way, it's just so easy to make bad loans or other similar type of things. And you don't know it until people can't pay their bills or businesses can't pay their bills during a recession. And then they get creamed, um, sometimes just completely go bankrupt. So I like to see that they can survive a downturn. Now this one's interesting. So this is insurance, which kind of goes in the same category. Um, it looks very expensive here. So I'm not sure, I would probably just put this one in the too hard category because it's, it, I don't think I would ever pay that much and it looks really overvalued. And so, yeah, I'm not sure 
I'm not sure why the market likes that one so much, but it probably I would probably never get a chance on it to buy it basically. Um, Sometimes think certain industries just get popular and um, that insurance is kind of like the credit in many ways as well. They can do really well and then all of a sudden not do very well. So this one's not going to have enough data because I only have a year and a half worth of data. What do they do? Industrial machinery is probably also cyclical so I probably want a lot more data. Um, let's see, uh, mortgage REITs are always in the too hard category for me. Um, that was ESNT, ETRN. Come on now, my computer's slowing down on me. There we go. So I already mentioned before, I don't usually get into midstreams, especially not one where there's not very much data. I'm gonna put this one in no data or not enough data. It doesn't even look so great, honestly. Um, just this doesn't really interest me. Let's see, Evercore, EBR. So we know it's gonna be financial again. I really like to have recession data for financial stocks so we can see what they've done in the past. So now we can see here that earnings declined a lot back in 2008, right? So that's immediately a deeply cyclical business that's economically sensitive. Whenever a recession comes around, you should expect earnings to fall quite a bit. Um, we had the COVID bust, which Investors now think of bottom, so they're investing for this uptrend. Uh, investment banking and brokerage. Um, I would put this in the deep cyclical category. Probably I wouldn't buy it on the way down. <laughs> I'd probably buy it on the way out. I mean, even if you picked it up, you know, coming out of what's that like? Let's just go up to like to, uh, halfway through 2009. You know, you could have got a 100% return over the next five years, right? That's pretty good without trying to pick a bottom when everything's going crazy. That's kind of the category this would fall into as a deep cyclical. Probably, chances are I'd be totally invested by that time anyway, but you never know. I mean, if I had a bunch of cash left over and I was looking for something, maybe. EWBC. So this is going to be a regional bank. Typically regional, I, I should double check that before I, yeah, okay. Um, typically regional banks trade similarly to the overall regional bank index. You can see they got totally creamed in 2008, but they did eventually recover. Um, so I would say this is like, a, this is probably investable as a deep cyclical, even though it probably wouldn't be like my first choice. Um, if you do pick one of these up when they're super cheap and people are panicking, like 2020, I won't even pick the very bottom. I'll just, that's like halfway down. Um, you know, you can get a good return off the bottom. So, and they did, even though they got hit very hard, they did recover. So they at least have a history of recovering. Um, that's the main thing that I look for. It's not 100%, um, but it you can rule out some of the weaker businesses, I think that way. You, it's kind of a minimum standard. So, Excel Biotech. Is it Excel? Let me double check that. I said Excel, but it is E X E L. All right. Okay, so this would just be way too hard for me. Earnings, you never really basically know what they're gonna do. Um, it doesn't fit my type of historical earnings analysis or anything. Um, okay, that was, okay, so EXLS. Whoops, EXLS. 
L S. Whoops. Yes. I'll get it. I'll get it. All right. Come on and load. Oh, here we go. I'm, I'm being a little impatient. Usually it goes a little faster than this. Okay, so this looks pretty good. We do have a deeply cyclical earnings during that last downturn. They sort of hit overdrive um, when we had the pandemic. Before that, earnings growth is really steady. So let's look at basic earnings too. Those still look pretty solid. Let's see what these guys do. Data processing outsource service. So this is really interesting um, because most of these type of stocks have gotten creamed because of AI. So I would definitely take a look at this one. Uh, yeah, this looks pretty interesting. I think definitely during a recession, it would get hit pretty badly. Let me take a look. Let me shrink this real quick. Now I'm curious. I don't track this one, so maybe I should. See, it's useful to just look through stuff sometimes. I'm pretty sure. I know I don't. I'm almost positive I don't track it. So it did fall 80% during the Great Recession. So here's probably what I would be looking at. And since I've mostly been avoiding these outsource services and data processing businesses, because um, a lot of them have been pretty weak, I would say that if we do have a recession and it does get hit really hard, this could be a potentially a really good opportunity. So that's one. I'm actually even going to write myself a little note to, <laughs> to get this one in my spreadsheet. So this would be kind of one that I would want to keep my eye on particularly because I don't know what the returns have been. But if you would have bought, I'm not, is that, that's not even, I'm just going to randomly pick a spot down here in 2008. Um, again, I've never even heard of it. It's a 2,000% return. So if you can get this one when it's like 65% off its high or something like that and start adding during a recession, this is the type of thing where you could get good returns. And, you know, it doesn't really look like you're taking a ton of risk if they kind of can do historically what they've or kind of do what they did historically. It's the type of thing I like to look for, actually. Um, okay, so EXP, we have two left. EXP, I've owned this one before. They do like construction materials. Think like drywall, if I remember correctly. I don't know, if maybe wood even too. So this is a deep cyclical. I bought it during this decline here, coming out of that, and made like 50% in a few months or something. Um, and then sold before this decline, before the 2020 decline. Of course, I didn't think housing was going to like completely take off and inflation was going to take off. So um, this is going to be a deep cyclical. I wouldn't be buying it on the upswing here because, well, let's go back to 2008. We might need, we don't even really need to go back. You can kind of see it here probably. So you don't even have to have a super crisis for it to fall 65%. I guess a pandemic might be a super crisis, but... Again, back here during the housing, you know, again, 75, 80% decline. Um, so that's the risk you take when you're buying up here. We don't know when the next downturn will be, um, but it will be, it'll happen at some point. So I want to buy during the downturn. I would be willing to buy that one on the way down too. Yeah, so some of the cyclicals I like more on the way down. Some I love especially like financials and things like that. I like to wait till some of the bad news has come out. Some of the tide gets gone out. Um, what are these guys doing? So these guys look like, so research and consulting. Okay. So they have a pretty good earnings history here. But right now, I mean, they're flat, 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 flat. So this would be a, like a multiple compression worry for me. Uh, the P is 50. I have no idea why it's trading that high. But I, for me, this isn't... I would have quality questions about it. Um, so I probably wouldn't track it too closely. I think I do follow it. But, um, you know, back here would have been a little bit better time. Um, but earnings just aren't really growing enough to support uh, 50 PE, in my opinion. So, okay. So is that all of them? Yes. So let's go see what we have here. So there should be about 30 of these if I marked them down right. We have 
seven that would fit the full cycle strategy that's my usually where most of them tend to fall um and then four for the deep cyclical strategy three for the profit growth strategy three reits and that's it so that's like each there's about 30 so 10 percent fell in the reit category 10 percent in the growth a little over 10 percent for deep cyclical and then like 25 percent um, give or take for the earnings-based strategy. So what is that? 7, 11, 14, 17. About half, a little over half fell in some strategy. So I was willing to kind of set aside about half, um, a little less than half of the stocks I went through. And the rest of these, I can usually what I'll do is I'll go, I'll look at them, I'll look a little closer. Usually I eliminate a few more after I look a little closer. And then the rest I put into a spreadsheet and I'll track them more often than I would when I'm just going through stock by stock. Um, so I don't spend time on things that I are probably not going to meet the standards that I'm looking for um, overall. So if you enjoyed this, hit this or you found it useful, either one, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Um, I'm going to try to make one of these about once a month. I was a little late this past month. I skipped June because I was busy. But um, and then I'll put all these in a playlist for everybody. And if you think fast graphs, if you if that looks useful, I have that link down for twenty five percent off for new people who haven't used fast graphs before. Um, and I'll see everybody later. Bye.